Good morning. I'm Pastor Dan. Well, today we're continuing our message series entitled Courageous Leadership. In this series, we're going through the exciting book of Joshua, one of the greatest leaders in the Bible. We're learning leadership principles that can be applied to each one of our lives. Now, this morning, my message is entitled Leadership Challenges. Now, last Sunday, we talked about the incredible victory over Jericho, where God caused the city walls to miraculously collapse. Now, you would think that after that great victory against insurmountable odds, the next battle would not be a big deal. But today, we're going to see that even for a great leader, things don't always go smoothly. There are challenges in life for each one of us. James 1 verse 2 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And so James clearly tells us that as believers, we are going to meet trials or challenges of various kinds as we go through life. Rather than worrying or being upset at life's challenges, we are to rejoice. Why? Because God has allowed those trials to come into our lives for a purpose. The purpose is that through the testing of our faith, it will grow stronger and pure. So when trials or challenges come into our lives, oftentimes we're tempted to blame what happens on other people, on Satan, or even God himself. Blaming others for our trials doesn't help anything and certainly isn't counting it all joy, is it? Now, sometimes the reason for the trials that we face isn't with others, but with ourselves. James 5 verse 15 says, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Well, this is a wonderful promise. Sickness is a trial or challenge in life. It's something that we all face from time to time. And when we are sick, we are to have other believers pray for us. When we pray for healing, these verses indicate that an impediment to healing is sin in a person's life. Now, the Bible is clear that not all sickness is a result of sin, but some is. And so when we are seeking prayer for healing, we must be careful to deal with any unconfessed sin in our lives so that God's healing power can be released. Unconfessed sin in a person's life can stop the flow of God's blessing and can instead bring God's judgment. Now, today we're going to learn from the life of Joshua how hidden sin can have tragic consequences, not just for the person who sinned, but for the entire group of God's people that the person is a part of. The first principle that we want to learn is about the corporate consequences of sin. Our story begins in Joshua 7 verse 1. It says, But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things, for Achan took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Now, previously, God had commanded all of Israel to not take any of the plunder from the conquest of Jericho. All of the perishable items were to be destroyed by fire, and the gold and the silver were to be taken into the treasury of the Lord for the tent of meeting. However, one man, Achan took some of the devoted things and hid them. And so God was angry against not just Achan, but the entire nation of Israel. There were corporate consequences to the individual sin of Achan. Now, at this point in the story, the writer tells us what happened, but neither Joshua nor any of the other Israelites, except Achan and his family, knew anything about this sin. So back to our story. The next city after Jericho to be conquered was a city named Ai. 
Joshua again sent some men to spy out the city, and they returned to Joshua with their report. It says, They said to him, Do not have all, do not have all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about three thousand men went up there from the city, and they fled before the men of Ai. So having defeated the powerful city of Jericho, the spies were confident it would be very easy to defeat this small city of Ai. And so they recommended just taking a few thousand men, a small force, to attack the city. Now this was a fraction of the entire army of Israel, estimated by some to be around 200,000 men. And while things did not go as planned. When the three thousand Israelites attacked Ai, the army of Ai counterattacked and the Israelites fled. As they were being routed, 36 of their soldiers were killed. And so the defeated soldiers came back to report to Joshua what had happened. It says in verse 6, Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, he and the elders of Israel. And they put dust on their heads. And so Joshua knew that something was terribly wrong. God had delivered Jericho into their hands. But what had happened at Ai? Not only had the Israelites been defeated by a smaller force, but word of this would spread to the surrounding enemies. The news of Israel's defeat would embolden their enemies and possibly cause them to form an alliance to defeat Israel. And so Joshua and the leaders of Israel mourned before the presence of the Lord in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Then God spoke to Joshua in verse 10. Get up! Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. And so the Lord now reveals the cause for the defeated Ai to Joshua, which we have known from the beginning of chapter 7. Someone in Israel had stolen some of the devoted things and hidden them among their belongings. The sin of one man had impacted an entire nation and had already caused the death of 36 soldiers. Sin has serious corporate consequences. Now the principles we are talking about in this point, I believe are a huge blind spot for Americans. As Americans, we are very individualistic. We believe that our actions, right or wrong, don't really impact other people. And yet this sin of Achan, even though he hadn't stolen from any of his fellow Israelites, brought God's anger and judgment upon the entire nation. Sin is deadly and it always impacts both the person who commits the sin and those around him. The sin of one person impacts their family, impacts their church, impacts their state, and indeed their nation. Some sins are more serious than others. Since the Roe v. Wade decision by the Supreme Court in 1973, 60 million babies have been murdered through abortion. Because of this great sin, God's judgment is upon America. Since this decision, we have been going downhill morally at an increased pace. The Bible speaks in many places about the sin of child sacrifice, the shedding of innocent blood, it is the worst sin in God's eyes. Many false teachers are teaching today that abortion is just one of many issues. And so they say it shouldn't be the deciding factor in how you vote. But according to scripture, it is the most terrible sin. And we must vote for the leaders and the party that are doing the most to eradicate it from our country. Sin has corporate consequences. There are also individual consequences of sin. Moving on to Joshua 7, verse 12, God says, 
Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. And so God is telling Joshua what the consequences of sin on Israel would be. Because of an individual sin, the entire nation had been defeated in battle. In fact, since they had stolen something from the plunder that was devoted for destruction, they themselves had become devoted for destruction. In other words, God's presence had departed from Israel and he would no longer protect them or fight for them. Joshua and the leadership of Israel must destroy the devoted things that had been stolen and hidden among them as well as the people. God said in verse 13, Get up, consecrate the people, and say, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, There are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. And so the people of Israel were to be consecrated to the Lord. To consecrate is to be set apart as holy unto God. The sin that was in their midst must be exposed and then removed. And so God gave instructions to divide the people into groups, and he would tell them which groups to pick. The groups would get smaller and smaller until they came down to one family, one family that was responsible for the taking of the devoted things. Verse 15 tells us what happened. And he who was taken, who is taken, God says, he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire. He and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. And so the consequences for the one found to be guilty of this great sin was that he and all he had, including his family, would be destroyed. He had broken the covenant commands of the Lord and done an outrageous or terrible thing in the nation. Verse 24 goes on with the story. It says, And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold, and his sons and daughters and his oxen and donkeys and sheep in his tent and all that he had. And so Achan was chosen, and it was found he'd stolen silver, gold, and a cloak. And so all of his family, his animals, and all of his possessions were brought before the nation of Israel. And Joshua said, Why do you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. And so the entire family was stoned until dead and then burned with fire as the Lord had commanded. And so Joshua had executed God's judgment upon them to remove the sin from the nation. I remember when Israel crossed the Jordan River, a monument of stones was raised up because of that miraculous crossing. And here the family of Achan was then covered with a huge heap of stones, a monument to what happens to someone who disobeys God and brings his judgment upon the nation. Now, why did Achan's family receive the same fate as him? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us, but undoubtedly the family was aware that Achan had stolen those things and they had done nothing about it. They shared in his guilt. And so there are great individual consequences to sin. In America today, sin is often laughed at and, and many times glorified. As Christians, we must stand for what is right and what is true according to God's word. There's a remedy for sin no matter how terrible, and that is the forgiveness of Jesus by putting our faith and trust in him. And yet even for believers, sin can bring great consequences, terrible consequences, both individually and corporately. 
Now, as believers, the Bible teaches us that we are warriors for God, just as there were soldiers in Joshua's army for the Lord. Sin in our lives creates chinks in our army armor. These are unprotected areas that can be attacked by Satan and his demons. Unconfessed sin often leads to greater sin and bondage of all kinds. The New Testament makes clear that the sin of one person in a church can lead to God's judgment upon the whole church. And so we must be careful to walk in holiness and to confess any sin in our lives. We must also do our part to expose sin around us so that it can be dealt with and cause no more harm. God, I believe, is exposing sin in America today. We see it being exposed on our television screens and on our internet sites. And I believe that is going to continue. The individual consequences of sin are tragic. But that leads us to the next point about the benefits of removing sin. Moving on to Joshua chapter 8, verse 1. It says, And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city and his land. Now we've already seen that when the sin of Achan was dealt with, God turned his anger away from Israel. And now we see that God gives new instructions to Joshua. It's important to note that in the first attack on Ai, there was no seeking of God mentioned, nor did God give any instructions. And now God again tells Joshua to not be afraid, despite what had just happened at Ai. Joshua was not to assume that the defeat of Ai would be easy. He was to take all of the fighting men, which would be an overwhelming force. And God then gave Joshua the assurance that he would help him defeat Ai. In verse 2, he says, And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourselves. Lay an ambush against the city behind it. And so just as Jericho, as at Jericho, the Lord gave Joshua specific instructions, both in a battle plan and in how to deal with the plunder. The plunder consisting of the animals and other spoil could be taken this time, contrary to Jericho. The battle plan was to lay an ambush behind the city. And so Joshua divided the entire army up into two forces. One force, a smaller force, would attack from the front. The larger force would circle behind the city and be hidden. The smaller force would attack and draw the soldiers from Ai out of the city to pursue them. And then the larger force would invade Ai, set it on fire, and trap the army between the two forces. Well, that's exactly what happened. Verse 26, But Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out the javelin until he had devoted all the inhabitants of Ai to destruction. So Joshua burned Ai and made it forever a heap of ruins as it is to this day. And so the plan of the Lord was carried out. All the people in the city, 12,000, were destroyed according to the Lord's command. The conquered was city was burned, became a heap of ruins, never to be rebuilt. When the sin was removed from Israel, the Lord was again with them in battle and gave them the victory. Now, people often wonder why every person in the cities that Israel conquered were to be destroyed. And the reason is twofold. First of all, these Canaanite nations were incredibly decadent and sinful. They indulged in every sexual perversion, such as homosexuality, bestiality, ritual sexual practices in their idol worship, and even child sacrifice to their demonic idols. And so the first reason for their destruction was God's judgment on their sin. In a sense, this is a picture of the final judgment, when God's wrath will be poured out on all unbelievers for their sin. 
Now, the second reason for the destruction of the Canaanites was that their sinful presence around Israel, if not destroyed, would serve as temptations for the Israelites to follow in their ways. And so removal of that temptation would help Israel to stay true to the Lord God. Unfortunately, as we continue to read through the Old Testament, as the conquest continued, not all of the Canaanites were destroyed. And we see that Israel succumbed to their pagan idols and practices again and again. So how does this apply to us today? Well, we are surrounded by unbelievers whose ways are sinful and perverted, just like the Canaanites. The Bible speaks of them and, and their lives as the world. And as believers, we are to be separate from the world and its sinful ways. In our own lives, we are commanded to put to death the sinful deeds of the flesh that arise from succumbing to worldly temptation. We are to ruthlessly eliminate all sources of temptation from our lives. Jesus made a shocking statement. He said, if your hand causes you to sin, you should cut it off, for it's better to go to heaven with one hand than hell with two. And that describes how ruthless we must be with things that lead us to temptation. And so as Israel dealt with the wicked Canaanites, so we should deal with the things and the people that cause us to sin. Now, of course, I don't mean to kill them. God doesn't mean that, but to eliminate ungodly influences from our lives. And as we remove sin and temptations from our lives, we're going to reap the benefits of God's protection, God's guidance, and God's presence. When God is with us, we'll win the victories that he has for us as we follow his plans. Today we've talked about the reason for the shocking defeat of Israel at Ai. There was hidden, unconfessed sin in the camp of Israel. And as a result, God's anger was directed toward his people. When God is angry, the relationship with him is broken and the entire nation was defeated. Our sin has consequences for those in our circle of influence. There are also personal and individual consequences for our sins. God will bring judgment on us to get us to turn away from our sin. And of course, the answer is to confess our sins and receive God's forgiveness. When we are consecrated to God, when we are walking in holiness, his presence will be with us. And so we must deal ruthlessly with sources of temptation in the world around us that are getting worse and worse. But as we do, God will lead us into his victory in every area of our lives. This morning, I want to give you an opportunity to repent and become a believer. If you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ, I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to pray with me and to be born again. This takes three steps, three simple steps the Bible teaches us. First of all, you admit that you've sinned and turn away from that sin to repent. Secondly, you believe that Jesus died to forgive you and he rose from the dead. And finally, you commit your life to following Jesus as your Lord. So wherever you're watching this message, I'd encourage you to pray with me. Say something like this, Father, today, I admit that I've sinned, I've done wrong things, and I repent, I turn away from that sin. I confess it to you, and I turn away. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, that my sins might be forgiven. Please forgive me. Come into my life. I commit myself to following you. You've risen from the dead. You're alive today as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for coming into my life. And for those of us who are believers, let's pray as well. Father, we thank you for this sobering story from the life of Joshua. Use it, we, use it, we pray, to, to help us to wake up to the tragic consequences of sin, both in our own lives and the lives of those around us. Today, we repent of all known sin in our lives. We ask for your help to put to death the things that, that cause us to fall into temptation. Help us to be salt and light in our nation in this extremely important election season. 
May we influence others to vote for those who would protect innocent babies and who would lead this nation by godly biblical values. We ask that you would stay your hand of judgment and have mercy on our country. Help us to let your light shine through us into a dark world and bring many more to Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you've made a commitment to Jesus Christ or would like more information, I'd encourage you to connect with us via the link below this video. We'll pray for you, offer you some helpful materials. You can find out more information on our website, lifechurchstlouis.org. Our Sunday morning services are now open at 10 a.m. at 15036 Clayton Road in Chesterfield, and you're invited to attend if you live in the St. Louis area. Online donations to help us reach more people for Jesus are available at lcstl.org give. And next Sunday, we continue our message series, Courageous Leadership from the Book of Joshua with the message, Why Leaders Fail. I invite you to join us then. God bless and have a great week.